I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Giles Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. It's a bit of a milestone for I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee today. Um, or should I say, it's a, it's a milestone as far as I know. I mean, there's a possibility, probability even, that I've, I've maybe not been quite as forensic as I could have been in finding out what my previous guests get up to. You probably know Namo Mataxa best through her work as a radio and TV broadcaster and DJ. Um, but as the holder of a degree in psychology, and a master's degree in psychotherapy and counselling, and having had many years of hearing people's stories through her broadcasting work, she now runs her own integrated council practice. So I'm intrigued to learn, um, you know, really about her insights into the kind of the corporate side of the music industry, you know, the mindsets, identities, and also the skills that, you know, you sort of need to survive in that world. And, and also with becoming, you know, essentially sort of self-employed as well. So it's a fabulous honor to welcome uh, Namon to the show. Namon, thank you so much for coming on. Ah, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm really, really thrilled to be asked and, and good to be here, Giles. Nice to see no, you. No, not, not at all. It's, I'll say it's a pleasure. Um, so I guess you've, you've had to like the past sort of seven or eight months have been quite a big change for you with the, you know, kind of like sort of radio show sort of coming to end and then, you know, kind of going into the, into your counselling, fully into your counselling practice. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, the the pandemic didn't change much of either of my worlds. If anything, they both mm. grew. I mm. mean, things did change, but um, I kept working and I felt really grateful for that mm. in a world where lots of things were sort of falling away for people, especially work and, and routine. Yeah. And, um yes it, it, as you as you say electric ladyland came to an end sort of the beginning of this year um mm. but i haven't stopped broadcasting and i yeah. and the practice was sort of growing alongside mm. the show um and i think the show will resurface as well so it it's been a i suppose a continued journey in learning to integrate two worlds that quite often people have said oh DJ and psychotherapist how do you yeah. do them then uh, and, and me going yeah DJ and psych- how am I going to do those uh, and then uh, but actually surprisingly they do sort of intertwine and and you know uh, and, mm. and work together or at least that's what it feels like at the moment I mean I, I am working as you say uh, as a psychotherapist weekly and I see clients through a, a variety of issues and I am um, on the radio periodically yeah. uh, just collaborated with the Scottish Ensemble on a a piece that we took out on the road in uh, October and I've yeah I've got festivals sort of bubbling up next year to do some I think probably mental health work and you know mental health awareness and music so um, yeah I think it's been a period of, of working out how those two can can live together those two worlds. How have you sort of found that you know you, you know I began, I guess, sort of recently, but also sort of over the years, you know, kind of managing those multiple, you know, kind of strands of of, of your life and, you know, working out, you know, how you, you know, devote some time to your counselling practice, the others to to DJing. I mean, it's it's not an easy kind of blend blend to have, I guess, especially if you're trying to kind of grow your your practice as well. It's been a... <laughs> Yeah, I, I always kind of falter at that at the point at which somebody asks me how it works because I think oh I, I, partly it it works because I've thought about how much time I've got you know mm. it, it comes down to almost nuts and bolts of when am I doing this and when am I doing that and then what it's like to change hats I often think of it as kind of putting on a different hat and being in a different yeah. world and yet it's less like that these days because actually I am yeah, I'm more um, because I'm bringing the psychotherapy more, I suppose, into the radio work as well. So yeah, that okay. Less like a hat change. Um, it requires a lot of organisation. Very, mm. very supportive husband and family and a friendship group, um, and and a huge amount of organisation. And just thinking, you know, be you know, being I. I, I have to know when I'm seeing my clients, when I can't see my clients and if I can move them and then, mm. you know, having specific breaks, if I'm say covering breakfast for a week, then yeah. I wouldn't do that alongside client work necessarily. So 
yeah, I suppose it involves thinking about all of those things as well. And, I mean, and I, I, when I'm not doing either of those things, how I'm taking care of myself. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I, I sort of worked in, um, I worked in sort of corporate life for, you know, for sort of many years until probably about three or four years ago. And, and, and kind of made a transition where, where I'm, do, I'm doing, you know, so lots of different things now. And, and it's, it, it was it was something that I really wanted to do, but but it it re- I mean, and I, I guess I, I knew what sort of challenges it would have, like 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 you say, you know, about looking after yourself, um, working out where you're going to sort of spend your time. But it's it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to sort of maintain that, and because you think, okay, well, I'll spend this amount of time on that, and then it, that doesn't work out, and then things get sort of flipped. And I guess it, from a sort of mindset point of view, you need to be. I mean, this is kind of one of the things that I'm really interested in is that sort of adaptability, you know, that that, that we need, you know, especially these days to to kind of manage these sort of multiple things that we work on, and also our personal lives as well. I think it's a really interesting point that you're making, Giles, about w- what we end up. Because you could, and I, I haven't worked in corporate world for a very long time. I started mm. in radio um, yeah. very soon out of out of my psych- psychology degree, like you say, at Kiss in Manchester. Yeah. Um, and was employed uh, and had employee status for a, mm. for a short time. But then as a DJ, have always been self-employed. So, uh, so in effect, from the late 90s, I've been self-employed and, so, and doing some sort of juggle although yeah. there have been pe- more periods of stability. And, and like you say, initially you might think I'm going to devote this amount of time to this and, and it sounds like on paper you could make it make sense. And of yeah. course it doesn't work out like that. And, yeah. and I suppose I have had to get more comfortable with the idea that it's a bit more messy. Mm. Um, and there have been periods in my life when I could work you know, late at night. I remember sort of Ladyland early doors when the kids were really little. So I'd be putting, you know, the, the little ones to bed and then be doing my listening and getting the tunes yeah. ready for the show. At the, and and that I was able to do that for a long time. Actually, I'm less able to work as late as <laughs> these yes. days. But um, I think that sort of creeps up on you, doesn't it? But but I suppose it's being having that kind of flexibility uh, and and learning about the ways in which you flourish uh, and mm. perhaps ways that you do, that, that that aren't working for you and thinking about it differently but it's not always easy you're right did you find when, when you were um sort of self i guess sort of self-employed or sort of freelance yeah. with with um you know once once you left kiss which was independent and then sort of moved into the into the bbc i'm guessing you you, you didn't have employment employee status then you were on a kind you're of still freelance. freelance you're still self-employed. yeah yeah um but did did you did you feel like an employee did it feel like you were in a kind of corporate world or corporate environment or did you feel still feel you know freelance i think i've moved in and out of feeling like mm. that with various um jobs that i've had or, or shows that i've done i think if you are on the radio every single day doing the same Mm. time slot there becomes an element of that that feels like i'm doing the same you know i'm in the same Same thing same same thing you're still not an employee because what you bring is is something different to that environment every day but um yeah i suppose i and and you don't have long-term employee status so you're still kind of like oh well you know i've got a contract for a year two years I think yeah. the one I had was three years for a certain amount of show you know a certain show and mm. then it changes again you know then you move to weekend shows and that feels more like a freelance lifestyle and then there's all the things you do outside so there's never a sense that um and nor has there been for a long time I've got this job and this is what I see myself doing for X number of years. Mm, and I think that mm. that has changed within our lifetime. Yeah. Um, that there just is less stability in the, in the workplace and, and, yeah. and t- t- for great, you know, to great ends actually in lots of ways, because it can keep things fresh. It keeps people um, being creative and thinking about the things that they're doing, mm. thinking of and brings new people in to think about, um, ways of doing things differently that can be 
you know, yeah. as rewarding for a listener than listening to the same person all the time, if you see what I mean. Uh, yeah, and, and you, when you started um, Electric Ladyland, that was, that, that, I guess that was, as a, correct me if I'm wrong, that was a sort of departure for, for Radio 6 at that time in terms of, you know, kind of electronic music, so, so, the, so the genre, if you, if you will, you sort of bring in more electronica in, into it. I mean, how, how, did you, how did you go about bringing that, bringing that in? Was that a relatively easy process to do? I think that we were already shows. So Craig was already doing the Funk and Soul show, and Giles was still doing the worldwide type yeah. show that he's he's always done on a Saturday afternoon. Um, but I very much felt at the time. So I started Lady Land. When would that have been? To, yeah, two thousand and twelve, thirteen. Twelve or thirteen. Yeah. Um, with because I'd done so much daytime, I knew that the playlist was not necessarily of that ilk. Yeah, um, I think the the musical landscape that we were living in in that time, albeit there was much more electro kind of infused music, mm. and synths were kind of creeping into to lots of people's work. Well, there wasn't yeah. the out and out dance um, dance elements that there are today, or electronic elements that there are today. So it was at a stage when, and I'd been talking about an electronic show for years before Electric Ladyland started. Mm. So in a way, I'd be like, we need to do this, we need to do this. Um, and it was great to finally have the playground, if you like, to, to be able to explore that and, and mm. to make it as multi-layered as, uh, as it was and, and, it, and it continues to be. So I, um, yeah, I really, and, and, and for me, I was able to let loose with some of the kind of areas that perhaps I couldn't play during the day that, that yeah. were too um, dissonant a sound maybe with, with the rest of the daytime to, to really let that go, you know, some, to mm. have some fantastic techno, which we just didn't play. And, and you know, when you look at the landscape on the, the daytime on six today, it's very different. And it feels yeah. like Electric Ladyland was a sort of, um, and has been a, a stepping stone on the pathway to, to to the six music that you hear today. Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and, and I guess because of that that change, did did, did you um, did the relationships that you sort of built up, you know, and the and the, and the the knowledge of the way that the organisation worked help you to then you know to to basically sort of take that to get them to agree to take that step into 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 Electric Ladyland. Oh, that's a really interesting question. I, I always felt that the grounding that I had, and this came from KISS. So when I started mm. at KISS in Manchester, I was on reception. Mm. I was answering phones. I wasn't DJing. And, um, and nor had I done a lot of DJing. So I, but I got to do everything at that stage. And, and really, yeah, okay. you know, I, I, to typing up sales reports, to, um, <laughs> going to a mayoral lunch where everyone was wearing their, you know, the big thick kind of um, mayor, yeah. mayor, mayor, mayoral chains uh, and taking a, God, what was it at the time? A, a portable recording device, but it had a special word. I can't remember actually, but, you know, late nineties piece of ancient equipment now. Um, pranging the sales <laughs> director's car on the way back. Oh my. Oh. The underground car park. Yes. I mean, all kinds of experiences, but um, you know, which gave me a great understanding of how how radio works in in all its different areas in news in marketing in sales mm, mm. in and we, we went and did the original um me and a couple of other people who were working at kiss in manchester at the time went and did uh quite went and stood on the streets of hull with questionnaires about whether people wanted a kiss alike station in hull and leeds you know we did oh, nice. we, we were on the ground and i suppose all of those experiences gave me an insight which then continued into, so when I got into the BBC, I was fascinated about how it worked. How does yeah. it work? What does that person do? How do they relate to, you know, and, and obviously my the first job was at Radio One. So I had a good grounding in where that sat in the organization, how it worked. But I suppose I've always been interested in that. And yes, so to your point, all of those things contributed and my experiences with um, the music industry and record labels and all of that will have contributed to, to being able to put together a prospect that mm. that six went, oh, okay, we've got space. We trust you to do it. Let's give it a mm. go. 
It's interesting that that um, that sort of cu- curiosity, I guess, in in sort of you know you know wanting to understand how the organisation works, you know, get into the sort of the nuts and bolts, and and also having that that wide experience and understanding of of you know the not necessarily in, in all parts of the nuts and bolts, like the the exact how, how things work, but broadly kind of how things work. She, it's just hugely important. I mean, I think, you know, often people think it's, it just applies to corporate world, but just generally kind of understanding how things work. I mean, it sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's it's just really important to, to you know, once somebody understands that or can see that you know what you're talking about, you understand that part of it, you know, it's a, it's a door opener. Well, I also think, actually, as you're speaking, Giles, if it, it's... It's what's um, it's at the heart of of what I'm doing now in terms of therapy as well. Yeah, understanding how people communicate and their way of being in the world and mm. my way of being in the world and how those two come together. That's also, mm. I suppose, in in the mix in in the therapy room as well, and yeah. certainly in my, has been in my work life. So when I first applied to do the the further study in psychotherapy, I was like, how? How do I write about my radio life? Do, is this a complete, you know, like U-turn or, or um, uh, tangential kind of pathway? Or mm. is there something in what I've been doing that is connected to this? And, and, it, and it felt in lots of ways that there was. It was learning about how the world works and, and yeah. in interviewing, sort of helping people tell their story, which is, which is you know, at, at the heart of therapy as well. Was it was that when when I said in the introduction that it was the it was the story it was you know hearing the stories and and you know allowing people to tell the stories did, did did that almost was that the catalyst almost for for you know moving into um you know t- setting up your business and sort of treating that as the okay well this is this is really interesting what makes people tick yeah I think I mean that has always been a, a I've always been fascinated by mm. how we are in the world and what and how two people can seemingly have similar ways of being and yet mm. the, what happens to them is completely different. So I suppose and he, hearing and talking to musicians and the guests that I've had on the show, the actors, the, the writers yeah. over the years ha, has just heightened or fueled my curiosity about how Mm. our experience shapes our lives and then what that then and the impact on us and then what that then uh leads people to do or how it leads them to be so that's definitely had a uh, an effect it's it's fascinating i i I, i'm i'm really sort of fascinated by by that you know by by our experiences and how that you know follows us into into life you know that we 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 sort of keep hold of that you know i haven't got the you know the 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 knowledge and the qualifications that that you have but i I i'm still interested in you know just from my sort of personal experience and how this sort of comes back to you years and years later i still remember one one time when i was a kid and um I'd, i'd been out playing with with some friends in the back field and I wanted to go in and it was, it was a classic sort of situation. It was my ball. I wanted to, I was maybe eight or nine years old. I wanted to go in and I took my, my ball. And one of my friends went and told his mum that I'd basically sworn at him, told him to F off. And, um, and I hadn't. And my dad found out and my, and my dad basically grounded me for a week. So he believed somebody else over, over me. And that stayed with me for so long. Well, I, it's so, yeah, I mean, these, those formative experiences and it can be a situation with our friends. It can be how we're reacted to by our parents, the people who are caring for us. Mm. They have such, um, yeah, long lasting effects. And I'm yeah. actually listening to a brilliant podcast by, by a guy who I love hearing talking about in this area, Bessel van der Kolk, mm. uh, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score which loads of people have turned to in this very challenging, unusual time. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, and, 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 you know, lots of his work has been with trauma and lots of people talk about trauma in all kinds of different ways. But mm. some of the experiences we have when we're much younger are traumatic, you know, um, and they're, 
kept we sort of um we react in the body in a way that it holds it in our system Mm -hmm. and that can be triggered later in life when the original experience isn't present anymore but the bodily reaction feels very similar so very similar anxiety fear um upset you know not being believed Mm. um and that can have all sorts of implications yeah going back to when when you were a kid and and sort of you you know what what were your sort of formative sort of experiences and influences that that sort of shaped you know how you how you kind of grew up how long have you got giles (laughs) <laughs> as long as you want I mean, i'm sure it's fascinating I mean, well I, I don't know about that i think it i i having you know done the type of study that i've done uh, uh over the past 10 years um has allowed me to kind of or i've i've been given the space and this is what is wonderful about this kind of training mm. the space to really think about those experiences yeah. um and i would say hugely loving um environment as a child Mm, mm. but lots of illness and disability in a time when there was a culture of silence in the uk that meant that we didn't talk about cancer we didn't talk about death we didn't talk Mm. about disability in the way that we're talking now Mm. and i think those things uh, have had a huge impact on how i am in the world um and um yeah and some of the ways in which i navigate the world even today mm, mm. and and uh, you know your your kind of um sort of interest in in music was that was that again from a from an early age you know within the within the sort of the family was music played yeah I did. my dad had a record collection and a and a turntable very mm. old pioneer turntable that i I then took it to university and trashed, obviously, and then bought my own. <laughs> I'll worry about that. Um, I've still got some of his records, actually, I think. If I turn to the record shelves here, I'm talking to Giles, if you're listening, but from my little office, which has my record shelves next to me. I could find Moody Blues. I could find, uh, you know, Tubular Bells. I could find Pink Floyd. Um, so there was a lot of music of that kind of late 70s um, mm. I don't know it was probably more rock there wasn't much disco there wasn't a lot of funk in our house and those are sort of um learnings that I you know rabbit holes that I just loved falling down when I finally came upon yeah. like, you know George Clinton and Parliament and Donna Summer and all you know all those things so but music was really important to me I used to incessantly play my recorder <laughs> to, to the I would say joy but probably a bit too much <laughs> my parents um and then my flute I, I learned to play the flute so I learned a woodwind instrument I both my kids now learn the piano and the guitar because they are the instruments I would have yeah. <laughs> but, right because you, you can't re- you can write music on a flute but it's not really you can't go into a band and go play the flute it's yeah. much harder um yeah. and I did I was lucky to play in bands I played with the guys from Groove Armada in an early funk incarnation called the Thumper Swords yeah. and I played saxophone there and I sang but um, my flute became hugely important to me during my teenage years and I played it incessantly after the death of my sibling and I mm. I knew probably that it was helping I don't think I realized that that was probably a way of grieving or at least music was an outlet for me to express things I didn't have words for and I, I mm. think through um, the training that I've done that's what I've come to to see it as is a real um, yeah part of my grieving process so music became hugely important I, I like another language and I always felt that Electric Ladyland was a we it there was a there was a layer of me talking about music and playing records and then there was something probably deeper of me the way in which I choose music is is very intuitive it's it's kind of based on a gut reaction or a, a, a feel so um there are probably multi-layers to me talking about music mm. and that sort of that, that kind of gut instinct in music that that's just sort of something that that comes naturally to you you and you know is, is that something that you rely on quite a lot even 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 now 
Yeah, I think so. I think <clears throat> I think it's a. Um, I mean, I you know when I'm putting together playlists and shows, there'll be all sorts of things going on. It'll be obviously a, 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 it'll be for a specific event or show, yeah. and I'll be thinking about all kinds of things: the mix, the the you know the number of artists, the the difference in the artists that I'm playing and the musical styles. But underpinning all of that is oh god does that record make me feel like it needs to be like it needs to be in this playlist yeah (laughs) to be on this show and you know and and that's not it's not always strong it's been you know it's but but by and large yeah there'll be something about a record that I'm playing that there's a reason for it being there but uh, not so long ago I interviewed um Gemma Cullingford from Sink Your Teeth yeah and um she she was saying I asked her about her because she she played the flute and now she t- she also teaches um, ukulele to to young kids. Yeah. She was saying about uh, like her I asked her about her you know kind of musical background and you know whether she'd been she'd taken lessons or she was just self taught and she she said something really interesting. She said that she's um, she was just self taught mm. um, and and the, and the, she is her personality is she is not a rule breaker so if she she feels that if she had learned something you know through you know formal training and textbooks of the musical theory because she's not a rule breaker she would have stayed within the the boundaries of what she was taught but by not doing that she's been that's allowed her to kind of almost experiment in 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 a kind of musical creation which i thought was fascinating yeah that's a brilliant way of uh, of framing that isn't it how yeah. one so actually better yeah that she found her own way to it yeah than formal training and I think you see that in all sorts of areas don't you it's it's mm. people feel like they can do something differently yeah um, and step outside and quite often we're modeled so many things by the people who look after us and you know our primary carers it's not mm. it's not often there wasn't anyone working in music actually in in my family and I mm feel a little bit to um something resonates of what you're saying that that Gemma said in that I didn't think that I could be a DJ or that I would that that was a job for me initially Mm. I had loads of male friends interestingly who were all bedroom DJs and I loved it but it just didn't girls weren't doing that girls weren't playing football obviously which my young daughter now says I can't believe you never played football but it just wasn't (laughs) just wasn't it just it just wasn't yeah. there yeah, and I and I, yeah. I feel about myself I'm like god was I blind did I did I ask and then wasn't allowed or whatever but but it, it, on the music you know on the working in music for a job that seemed like something that was sort of beyond me or or didn't happen yeah. to people like me and and I think in in terms of going into the radio station being a receptionist, answering the phone, having a kind of defined role that helped me in there. And then once I was in there, it was like, oh, my God. And you can do you can be in the studio and you can do this. And and then something kicked in that made me want to learn all those things or or find a pathway. I I remember asking everybody, how did you get to do what you did? And what did you how did you do that? And what's the thinking that, you know, somewhere I'd stumble upon the great formula that was going to allow me to become Graham Park or whatever, you know, and and actually, it, what's interesting, even talking to Graham now, is that that just, ha- you know, being in the environment, asking the questions, trying, you know, giving mm. it a go. That's all that, that that sort of all adds into the mix of being able to eventually work in yeah. music. I think that's, a, yeah, that's a, that's a good point about, you know, sometimes we, we get um, almost, almost like sort of too bogged down thinking this is, this should have happened by now and it kind of doesn't you know it's it, you, the the patience that you need to have and the the i guess positivity that that it that it will happen if it does happen it will happen you know or sorry if it will happen then it's it, it's that that is something that we just need to wait for we just need to to be patient with it it's sometimes life isn't it, it, it you know we get bogged down in thinking it needs to happen now that kind of immediacy almost well we have so many rules that are set for us all that that we 
make sense of the world when we're little and we kind of go, mm. oh, okay, so for that to happen, this is how I need to do it. And they stay with us a long time. Yeah. And they are the framework by which you navigate the world as an adult, mm. if any such as an adult actually exists. But that's for another podcast. Um, so you, you, you're locked in that way of doing things and it feels really difficult to go, oh, which is often what happens in the therapy room. You're just kind of discussing yeah. with somebody and you go, does it have to be like that? Oh, maybe it doesn't have to be done yeah. like that. Or maybe I can do X, Y, Z. And that's the unlocking is the kind of the, the realising that, that perhaps we can be in the world in a different way. And the way in which we're seen and reacted to as children means that there's lots of parts of us that we hide because mm. we don't feel like they're acceptable or perhaps we are, you know, perhaps we were too loud for our parents. Perhaps we, you know, or the, or, or the opposite, too quiet. And then you that becomes part of your shadow and the bit that you don't let out into the world later in life. It might be that you go, ah, oh, it doesn't matter if I make as much noise as I like. Wow. How yeah. interesting is that? Yeah. I remember that again, again, you know, when I, when I was a kid, I mean, I, I um, played the cello when I was a kid and, you know, I played it up to a really good standard till I was mm. I, I passed my grade eight. Oh, Giles. That is. Yeah. <laughs> when when I was 16, I got it when I was 16. And, um, you know, like in, in my family, like my dad, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an only child. My dad was more kind of, he, he wasn't formally classically trained, but he, he just had such an interest in music and he sung in choirs and he played the piano. And, um, but he was, a, he was a mechanical engineer. And for him, you know, that, that kind of safety of that, that almost like that, that linear job, that career, that sort of existed. I mean, he's now 92 next year. So he started work, you know, sort of in his, his fifties, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the 1950s. Yeah. And, and that, that sort of linear career was what was important. Yeah. You know, so even though, though he sort of had this interest in music and he wanted me to have an interest in music, he didn't encourage me at, at all to get, to have a musical career. I kind of wish I had done, but I think my mind was a little bit too, narrow as well and also I did because I was an only child I didn't want to um I guess upset them mm. if that makes sense you know I didn't yeah, want no, to completely it's not what really... I thought they wanted me to be absolutely and that's and that's another um rule in our head or kind mm. of and actually quite often when you ask people later in life did they say we don't want you to study music and we only want you to have a linear career path. Quite often it'll be like, ah, maybe that wasn't actually verbalized. Yes. That was what I took on board. I took on board. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's the unpicking of those sort of, um, yeah, strictures that we put on ourselves that Mm. can be really illuminating and and, and frightening in lots of ways. It's like, hang on a minute, it doesn't work like this. What? Mm. Um, but I similarly have an electrical engineer dad who, you know, quite academic career. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, a, a, a life in the music industry, which is not straightforward and certainly doesn't follow a linear path. Yeah. You know, he's immensely proud of what I've done, but I, mm. you know, I, and, and in lots of ways, you know, he's, he's bolted on bits to his career at, at this stage, but it isn't what they grew up with. It's interesting, like when, when my dad took retirement, he he um, set up his own small just for for three years or so, so uh, um, French polishing business. Amazing! That is I, was like, I was like, where did this come from? Yeah, I bet you <laughs> were. I bet you were like, <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. I bet you loved it. Oh, he absolutely loved it. So, over, over, I mean, over over your over over your kind of career, your life, your life. I mean. The, these these kind of like attributes that of you know kind of adaptability which ones do you what do you feel that you've you've really kind of learned and sort of gained from from your your kind of working life it's probably a big question that isn't it yeah yeah i'm just needing some some uh thinking time I think I'm always learning what is mm. <laughs> what's helpful. Um, 
I yeah when you when you gave us this I was thinking I was sort of thinking I mean you, you know what you mentioned earlier uh, um you know when you were saying you were curious about you know how the organization worked mm. um you know I'm, I'm thinking that you know the, some of the other things that I found that were were sort of in, I felt were important to to, to kind of develop and sort of learn with things like you know adaptability the ability to, to sort of adapt in different situations it's almost like that I don't, I don't like the phrase soft skills because I don't think they are sort of soft but that's the a term that sort of people use but things like um you, you know using your instinct um being agile and adaptable you know things like that I think that it it's I, th I think just think those are those are sort of important things to have it, it, if if not more important, equally as important as some of the technical skills that you need to, to kind of get through. Well, I think we've sort of been talking about that. I think it's I think if I'm understanding you correctly, it's the idea that you can be different to how you. So when you talk about adaptability, that's mm. understanding that actually I don't have to necessarily be in this environment in the way that I thought yeah. or can I can I navigate this differently mm, and that absolutely takes quite a lot of courage sometimes or yeah. a leap of faith I also think a massive amount of self-compassion and mm. compassion to others um and and listening really yeah. listening to sort of understand because all in every interaction every relationship there are always layers aren't there there's the content mm. of what's actually happening and then there is the process of the mindset that people have come to the meeting in or the interview or, yeah. the, or the piece of work that you're doing. And the, all those different things feed in and, and then learning more about how we are in interaction mm. that allows you to go, OK, so that makes me a bit angry. But I wonder why that makes me angry. Is it that I'm angry about that person or is there something else going on? So you kind of I think just the ability to, to perhaps give yourself a bit, a bit of space to process what's happening mm. can can be really helpful but but all of those things certainly add um to being able to find our yeah. way through it. i was going to say an industry that's so um you know not set in its ways like the music industry but actually the world's like that at the moment so just world is, yeah, yeah being in the world i remember um before i before i left my corporate job <clears throat> i did a um a test um i can't remember which one it was but basically it was like a sort of personality one of those sort of personality tests and and, and it came out with my sort of base personality which is a harmonizer and i'm, and I'm also a, a a kind of introvert as well um i remember being in so, so many kind of meetings um where there are people sort of talking over each other and just not uh, you, you mentioned about listening and sort of listening to what other or giving people the space to who may be introverts to put their point of view across and it made me think about how many good ideas are lost because of those sets, those sort of situations and those ideas are not allowed to to basically ferment no and they don't get any airing or or um, any acquisition no one grabs mm. hold of them but I suppose that is, you know, that's the world we're living in. It's like, oh, in that environment, what would happen if we gave more space to people? Yeah. And I think to, to your point, how do we promote a, a world that's more inclusive or how how do we communicate better mm. across great divides when when you might arrive at, at somewhere thinking, well, I definitely don't get on with that person because they think X, Y, Z, and yeah. I, I think the opposite. Mm more often than not there is a um there can be a meeting we don't have to all think think the same thing there's a brilliant mm. um i don't know it's a study or an experiment done by red bull i think it was where they brought together people from opposing sides of of, of whatever fence and got yeah. them to work on a problem together and it was just fascinating to watch mm. um or the, pe the people interaction, how they... Yeah, the guards coming down. Yeah, and, yeah. And sort of the, almost the realisation that, oh, if you'd have told me you were a Republican, I would never have got in the room with you. But actually, uh, we've done quite well on this task together, and I quite like you. Mm. you know, and 
just really rethinking their position. Um, and they did that over various, you know, differences. Do you think that? Do you think that that's be- because one, once people do connect, that, that you know, either you know, kind of visually or orally, that, that once there is that kind of connection built, then that 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 is the, the start of a relationship and a sort of understanding, with with almost like a sort of clean, um, a blank sheet of paper, as opposed to thinking, okay, you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. Oh, I think it's I think there are there's a huge number of layers going on in something like that. And I would also bring the body into this because we mm. unconsciously communicate with our bodies with that body, you know, on a on another level. Yeah. Um, I've just been talking about this with the Scottish Ensemble and why live music experiences are so important to us mm. and, you know, and what what it was like not having them. Um, you know, there's an enormous amount of comfort from being in the room with another body. And that yeah. is um we're not often aware of, of the reasons behind that. So yes, you put the labels on, it's like, oh, I don't want to be in the room with this person. But actually, there's mm. lots of reasons for us to, you know, are, if you like, neurons are vibrating on the sa- at the same yeah. level. We might find uh, that we actually do like, be- there's, a, there's a certain harmony in us being together. I wonder what that is. If we can get yeah. curious about that. Um, yeah, it could be a different place to live. Mm. What, what's your what's your opinion of um, emotional intelligence? Because I've sort of read a lot of, of Daniel Goleman's, yeah. um, you know, kind of ideas around emotional intelligence. Go and on, say a bit I, more. And his his ideas basically of um, that, that you can kind of break it down into um, you know things like 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 empathy, self management um self uh self motivation regulation yeah regulation um you know you know he, i mean he he puts emotional intelligence on a on a par in in some instances you know this it's a generalization but at least on a par as as um with with iq you know say that the, the these are the sort of things you know that that if we if we demonstrated more kind of empathy more sort of self regulation then that I think he's he's looking at it a, a lot from a you know from an employment perspective or from a careers perspective, but I think equally it applies in you know the, in in all parts of our life that these the, the, ha, using these attributes is is just a sort of fundamental part of being successful. However, you decide define success as a as a person through life. Well, I think the 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 idea that self-awareness and self-regulation could be equally as important to to iq it it is yeah that it there's there's a lot of worth in that because and also it's like what are we actually measuring and what Mm. we how do we want to define success what i mean what is success in any sphere of life in our because we often say don't we you're not going to get to the end of your life and go oh i wish i spent more time at work but you know you kind of like what what is the quality of the relationships that I'm able mm. to, to make in my everyday interactions, not even in, you know, in, in my world that I then take through, through life with me. Mm. Um, so I think anywhere where we're kind of breaking down some of those pro, you know, thinking processes yeah. about, oh, if someone's got an IQ of X, then it must mean, because quite often, you know, those, t- those two things don't go hand in hand, do they? Emotionally. Yeah. And, and iq um and i'd be really here i'm sort of wondering what we're actually measuring with iq yeah yeah i think you're right and i think that you know that that individual definition of success you know kind of what sort of success looks like is i don't know whether it, it the world we live in has sort of changed that or if it's just that, that we're more open-minded as to what what a successful life looks like and it's not it's not as um i guess narrow a definition as it it used to be saying my like my parents day well i think also what you're pointing to is the idea that we look outside for for what does it look like to be successful it's not often Mm. that we kind of look inside and go how do i want to define success and what does it mean for me to feel successful yeah. Yeah. just as you were talking then I was thinking you know we can look at a life and go well that looks successful but we've no idea what's going on inside that life 
Yeah. And, and then and that is a clue to the elements that we might like in our life, um, but they still might not land in the same sort of way. Yeah, um, so yeah. It feels like the di- feels like what you're pointing to is the difference between, um, you know, looking for ex- the external idea of what might be successful or how we mm. might feel. And then what it's like to really pay attention to how we feel and mm. if that feels okay yeah um and then and then what the possibilities for that are does that make sense John? yeah it does yeah no i, I it, it does i mean i think that it, I, I guess it's a, it you know we we have a, a sort of ever evolving identity as well or how we sort of perceive ourselves and uh, you know with, with that sort of comes you know with with those changes you know changes in how you define you know what what a good life looks like will will change as well mm. and i guess it's just sort of being more more sort of open minded to that i mean the other the other thing that you know sort of troubled me at at various stages through my life was was you know worrying what other people thought of me you know and, you know well, what if i do that well, what are they going to think yeah and I, I'll, I'll always remember one of my earlier podcasts, I was talking to, to Meredith Graves, and she said the thing that she uses is, is just a very short phrase, who told you that? If you can just say that to yourself, who told you that? And it's often, you know, you're worrying about people who have no similarities in your life, no impact in your life. You're just kind of worrying about what, what people think. Well, that can also happen non-verbally. So you might mm. get the impression that somebody doesn't like you. Mm. But we don't even know. Quite a lot of the time, our assumptions are based on all kinds of experiences that yeah. we have had that don't even apply to that person. And so yeah. what we're doing is going, oh, that's what they think. I can't be doing it right. Yeah. And, and then there's a whole other layer to unravel as to where that's yeah. come from. But actually, quite often, again, it's those, it's those young experiences where we've gone, oh, yeah, I can't be doing it right because mm. somebody's not accepting me for the way I am or they haven't, that hasn't gone down particularly well. I, I totally agree with you. There's quite often I'm really... Um, it feels uncomfortable when I'm putting new pieces of work together or it doesn't, they don't necessarily fit every time. And it might be a playlist or it might be a piece that I'm writing. And I have to give myself space to go, okay, what do I think of this? And and who am I trying, am I trying to please somebody or do I think this is okay? Um, Did did, did, did you, did you yourself sort of suffer from, um, you know, kind of bouts of, of, of lacking in self-belief and you know kind of like anxiety over you know sort of what you're what you were putting together or what you were trying to yeah trying to all achieve. the time all the time yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean I think that's um well I've come to learn of it as part of the creative process and I think yeah. people talk about imposter syndrome mm. which I think is part of the creative process it's the part that goes I can't you know I can't do this I can't possibly I'm mm. going to be found out mine isn't as good as as that person i don't have the skill set um and that that needs some working through to kind of go okay uh, and 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 it's not a um and again that's not linear because it'll come again at different various points in our life where we think oh i was feeling quite confident and now why why is that suddenly what's suddenly gone on there yeah. to make me feel and quite often it's because we've walked into an environment that is new mm. we know it it's unknown and therefore anxiety levels start to rise and we and and because of that we then the, the voices start to get louder that go oh mm. no i shouldn't you know i'm no good so, so, some of the work that you 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 have been doing and you've been you've been doing sort of recently with with mindfulness um as as that is has is that sort of interlinked into the into those that that kind of creative self doubt that the, the the sort of breathing and grounding exercises mm. belong to music came out of a lot of the work that me and colleagues and friends were doing at the beginning of the pandemic yeah. and that actually I use and we use quite a lot in relational psychotherapy um, in the therapy room which is um, yeah baseline for taking a pause and really checking in with how we feel mm. uh, and mm. allowing space 
for feeling yeah. which we don't often do in the modern world and we and certainly up to the pandemic i think lots of people had this sense of life like just getting faster and more busy and, yeah um it was a an enforced pause for lots of people and that's not always welcome mm. it doesn't always feel comfortable no i mean um, i i i i um but sorry, Giles, just one thing. I found sure. it really helpful at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's what prompted me to, to do that on the radio. Because I thought, mm. I wonder if, and it was, that was a leap of faith. Yeah. I thought, oh no, people are going to just go, what is she talking about? Why is she talking about mental health in this kind of mm. way? Is there the space for it at the moment? Is it too soon? Is it something that will resonate with people? Mm. Um, so I can remember huge nerves in first doing that. I think I was covering for Steve Lamarck, uh, yeah. March 2020. And me and my producer were like, okay, we'll give this a go. Let's see. Give it a and, go. and the the response was fantastic. Um, mm. Mm. And, and that's, you know, prompted me to, to do more. I found that, you know, going into, going into the woods, you know, sort of being amongst, uh, you, you know, into nature, and and you know amongst the trees was was incredibly powerful mm. no return to nature so kind of comfort comforting yeah 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 when you sort of face you know whatever you know whether it's i mean it was sort of in pandemic and, and post pandemic um whether it's sort of worries about you know leaving my job and starting things afresh and you know just all yeah. those kind of things where it's worries about about my children you know and going in and and but that that was it, it, it that felt really grounding for me yeah doing that the, just just being quiet there's some really great work i'm just trying to find her name actually by uh forest oh what's she called she is fantastic Bear with me. <laughs> Find her name. It, so it was, I guess it was the it was the idea of the forest, the Japanese idea of forest bathing. That, yeah. Well, this is she's sort of, a sort of forest ecologist. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. She's, um, yeah. Simard, I think she's called. Yeah. She's written "Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest," which effectively mm. talks about the com the communication between trees, but also the network that exists in nature, which is yeah. very similar to a sort of the what i was been talking about in terms of people connecting and and, and just how comforting that is mm, um mm. and we saw it in the pandemic people gathering to sing yeah you know trying to find ways of get, get keeping in contact for, for musical events even if we couldn't yeah. actually be together we were doing it online and there's something really comforting because that stimulates a really old reptilian kind of um comfort system in in mm. the, for for us that that's um, hugely beneficial. Do you do you feel that it that perhaps this pandemic maybe it was happening before but but this has given music a different dimension as to how it can be how it can be used. Yeah, well, I certainly think um, people have been exploring different ways. Of, of using of, of music and connecting mm. through music um and i would say we go in and out of awareness of just how important music is to yeah, us yeah. and that and, th and this situation has definitely flagged the importance of music to lots of different people i remember a, a few years ago going up to um nordoff robbins you know the the, yes. the sort of music yeah. therapy charity and and sort of sitting in they had a like an open afternoon well uh, open afternoon maybe just for an hour or so mm. and i sat in on one of their one of their sessions you know with their with their clients and it was incredible yeah i mean really incredible seeing the 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 reaction you know from you know a group of to, to their clients the group of strangers that were sat around you know, sort of a little bit of suspicion to then once the music started and the, the way that the therapist encouraged them to, you know, to pick up in different instruments in the room. Mm. And the, it was, honestly, it was staggering. Yeah, I know. And I think really incredible. it's, um, it taps into something nonverbal as well, which is great. Mm. So people who aren't necessarily, can't necessarily find the words, mm. uh, it's, it's, um, hugely affecting yeah wow well thank you so much namon that's been wonderful
I hope that's been useful, John. It's been a wonderful <laughs> chat. No, it's gone off in all sorts of directions. It has. I mean, I, I mean, I guess that's the that's the wonder of this type of podcast. You know, I can just say, well, it's an experiment anyway. It's brilliant. No, but it's it's absolutely perfect. I mean, I think you know, to go off in different, you know, on different tangents and explore different things is 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 just just exactly what I'm looking for. So it's been great, fantastic. Great. Oh, it's been lovely to meet you. Thank you, you so too, much too. for asking me to do this. No, not at all. Thanks for your time. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show, and I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.